What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again, and this time we return with Kyle Thomas of the Almighty Exhorter. Great to be able to talk with you today, man. Thanks for uh, starting this morning off on a great note. Thank you, Alex. I am. Thank you, Heavy New York. We're happy to be coming back to see you guys soon. Yeah, we're very stoked to have you uh, be coming back. That is what we have coming to St. Vitus is the ultimate Thanksgiving pregame. I can't wait for it. I mean, that's crazy. I'm, I was sitting there thinking like, Man, you know, Macy's Thanksgiving at parades like the next morning right there. <laughs> you should play there. You should, you, I'll write a letter to the mayor. I mean, I'm sure we could lip sync just like everybody else does. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. But start like a mosh pit in the middle of like Radio City and stuff. That would be beautiful. We, 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 we're we going to have to get your booking agent on the phone. We need to have a little chat. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. <laughs> yep. And I can't wait to show up to Thanksgiving the next day. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm late. I had one hell of a night last night. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, this is not the first time that I'll be on tour for Thanksgiving. But the good news is it's in the States. There's nothing more lonely than being on the road for thanksgiving in like germany or something because they don't have thanksgiving there <laughs> yeah yeah well uh you know uh, one of my closest friends from college he's from the uk and every thanksgiving we would just bust his balls <laughs> yeah how's your work day going man <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> but it's so awesome to have you here the thing you know we're really stoked about is that we got slot you're playing slaughter in the vatican front to back I mean, like, this is yes. going to be a epic, t like, uh, tour. Does it almost going to feel like, I mean, you know, I'm kind of asking this question a little bit prematurely, but, like, does it almost feel like that, you know, rehearsing this material and bringing this, you know, old school exhorter material back, it almost feels like, you know, we're going to be partying like it's the 1990s? Yeah, the only thing is, is, you know, the the, the joints and ligaments disagree, but uh, it, it is kind of a, a fountain of youth kind of experience we we did psycho las vegas uh, a couple of months back with slaughter in the vatican in its entirety and really it was it was leading up to that that we were like man we should really do a tour out of this with all the work that it takes to put into getting the album done in its entirety um because really before psycho las vegas the only time we'd ever really done that was the very first show back in brooklyn uh at St. Vitus uh, back in what 2018 I think it was yeah so uh, so yeah it's a special experience I think uh, to do these little specialty kind of shows uh, we're gonna we're gonna have some material uh, extra from from the other two albums as well additionally since we are headlining this this festival but uh, and that festival this tour package mm -hmm. but uh, yeah it's it it definitely brings me back it's easier for me to remember all of the words to the albums that I did when I was still a kid mm -hmm. versus albums that I did in the past five to 10 years. It's really kind of funny how that works, but uh, it's true what they say, uh, long-term memory stays with you better than short-term. Fair enough. Fair enough. And you know, we're going to be parting like, you know, that fountain of you thing. I can't wait to see the show and feel like I'm negative three years old again. I can't wait. Yeah, man, it's <laughs> negative three. I like that. Well, hell, I was uh, I was 15 years old when I wrote the lyrics to Legions of Death. So, what does that say about me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But hey, words of wisdom from the all the great Lemmy Kilmes, sir. If you think you're too old to rock and roll, it means you probably are. True. Yeah. Absolutely. I kind of wanted to go back, though, to the songwriting, because as somebody who has followed Exhorter's work, you know, like I would be able to tell what would be off Slaughter in the Vatican, what would be off of The Law, what would be off of even the newest album, More in the Southern Skies. Like, w when you wrote this album, what was sort of like the idea going into the making of your debut album? This is the debut. I, I just want to know, like, what was in the creative mindset? Well, it actually happened over a period of probably two two and a half years that that material was written for the first album um, our get rude demo came out in 1986 and a large portion of the slaughter album was on get rude you had uh um uh, homicide no 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 homicide was not on that uh legions of death analyst and exhorter we're all on Get Rude, 
and then uh, when we did the slaughter in the Vatican demo in 1988, we had homicide. Um, again, legions of death making another appearance. Uh, legions of death was on Get Rue also. Uh, slaughter in the Vatican, death in vain, desecrator. The only song on the album that was not on either demo was the tragic period that was written in 1988 so uh leading it leading up to it it was it wasn't like we we got the record deal in uh 1989 and then said okay let's start in this album most of the album was already uh well the entire album was already in hand when we got signed and uh but most of the songs had been several years in the making so uh at that time uh, we were probably almost kind of tired of some of these songs having recorded them three or four times already. So uh, there's a difference when you've got material that's been on the back burner for years versus when you're up next, which was what happened with the law, with having to come up with new material kind of you know on the spot because you're under obligation to uh, an entity that's funding your album. Um, but back then we didn't really think about it as much as it was probably just an instinctive reaction to the world that we were living in we we started out playing songs that we kind of wanted to hear uh we were we were all into crossover and and hardcore and punk and and heavy metal was the uh the kind of the the forefather of everything that we did for the most part, most of the guys in the band. Um, so like I said, just and when you're young and you're playing what you want to play, that's really your first thought I think is what would I like to hear? So that's what I'm going to play. Yeah. And did that determine what you would later do on albums such as the law? And even, you know, many years later with more in the Southern sky, or have you always like wanted to take a new approach to every album after slaughter in the Vatican? Um, I think the evolution between slaughter in the Vatican and the law was, was twofold. It was probably, uh, you know, we're, we're going to, expand things i think most artists in general musicians uh, or you know visual arts any you know interpretive arts any of those arts people are they're creative so by nature you tend to want to progress and grow but a lot of it too was um kind of a you know under the gun on the clock kind of mode um we we really weren't as prepared as I'd like to think we could have been for the law. Uh, so we ended up robbing the, uh, the get rude demo of a couple of songs, uh, incontinence was known as wake the dead on, on our first demo, the instrumental song and unforgiven. We, uh, we revisited that and tweaked it a little bit, but it still was pretty much the same song. And, uh, and then we ended up, uh, going for some low hanging fruit and putting into the void by black Sabbath on there because it always went so well on our live shows. But as far as new songs for that album goes, it was, there was, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, soul search me unborn again, the truth, the law and cadence of the dirge. And I, uh, I am the cross as another one that was actually written. That's the oldest of the newer songs for that album. Uh, that may have, been written in time for slaughter in the vatican or shortly thereafter um but like i said we we had to come up with an album and the label's going hey guys you know come on and so that ended up being why some of those older songs made it to the album we just didn't have enough new material and when you're writing songs of 27 parts i think you're kind of uh kind of shortchanging yourself uh that's probably four or five albums extra between those first two albums with as many parts as we had in those songs and uh you know you can you can hail them for being epics or you can scratch your head and go man we really kind of uh uh blew our wad a little too early there perhaps you know and instead of 
I, I think when we approached more in the southern skies we we kind of refined it a little bit more uh our songwriting skills definitely improved mm -hmm. i would like to think definitely i thought more than the southern skies like like I put that on the level of comeback albums, like what Carcass was able to do with Surgical Steel, or Thanks. you know, like that to me was the comeback album of 2019. And I do got to ask this wow. for this upcoming tour, though, because last year was the 15 year anniversary of Roadrunner United, and that song you did, Constitution Down, with you know Joey Jordison, may he rest in peace. I mean, that was just also a, an amazing vocal performance, and what I would also consider to be the greatest compilation album ever, just my opinion. But uh. Can you maybe see yourself digging that out of for the deep cut, maybe? Man, I, I, I would be honored to do that, um, largely for, you know, Joey's sake. Joey, at the time that I was invited to, to, to be part of that, I was, uh, I was married with children and really just not in the epicenter of what was going on in rock and roll for a few years at that point. And um, Monty Connor bridged me to Joey because Joey was interested in me doing one of the songs. And when I talked to him, I was like, you know, let me just say right out the gates, dude, I don't know a single Slipknot song. I, I've heard Slipknot, but I don't know any of the songs unless there's a song called Slipknot. Um, if somebody put a gun in my head and said, name a Slipknot song, I, I'd probably be dead. And he said, well, that's okay. I don't even care about that because he grew up as a fan of exhorter and he said man let me get this out of the way my friends and i grew up listening to you guys we pretended to be you guys in the garage and to me it's just an honor that you'd even consider having me so we had we right out the gates mutual respect uh i would love to play that song based off of that uh but at this time if that were to happen, it probably wouldn't be until sometime next year at the earliest. If it was that's what I felt like doing, I would I would put that up for vote for sure. But I mean, th we could. There's a lot of things that we could go back and start. You know, we could pull out Grip Incorporated songs uh, with Jason's involvement. You know, so I I don't know how much I want to get into doing stuff by other artists unless it's like something cool like pulling out a black sabbath song like we've done in the past yeah. or you know uh many years ago we used to do dri bad brains um black flag you know this all kind of cool stuff uh things sometimes that people might not expect to hear from us or that we were giving nods to uh certain influences in our life that you know our musical lives that uh, that we felt should be honored yeah uh, i'm not saying never but we did do it uh when when uh, i went to japan with the death metal all-stars which was kind of what became devil's highway that still never happened uh uh with you know the late ralph santala steve de giorgio jack owen and um tony loriano and myself we we learned a handful of songs from each guy's bands to play live in Japan, which was really fun. So we were playing Exhorter, Deicide, Obituary, um, Sadus, uh, just kind of you know Cannibal Corpse, just kind of going through and making a compilation of all of our bands. And we did because Steve DiGiorgio also played on Constitution Down. We learned that song and played it, and uh, that was really fun to play live. Yeah, I, I, I was happy that I finally got a chance to play it live, and not to mention with one of the guys that was also on the recording. That was definitely a cool thing. Yeah, like if I had a time machine, like I would love to have gone back to that concert, the Roadrunner All Stars, but I was just finishing elementary school, so I sadly had to miss <laughs> that. But uh... well, I. I actually wasn't invited to the one that, that they did. Where was it? CBGB, I think they did no, it. No, they did it uh, at um, what would late, at the time it was Nokia Theater, but they renamed it to Best Buy PlayStation, and now it's renamed to something else, but it was in Times oh, Square. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't invited. <laughs> uh, well, their loss. <laughs> um, but, and kind of like what you referenced before, because Exhorter, I feel like, isn't just like, like, I don't think that there's such a thing as an exhorter sound, and I mean that as a compliment, as a way like you have, you're not just a death metal band, you're not just a hardcore band, you're not just a groove metal band. It almost seems like you took inspiration from multiple sources, right? Truth, truth. 
Yes. Um, I, it's funny. I had this question in an interview the other night, and and it was, you know, how 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 would you label this band? And 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 that's really always been something that I wrestled with. I I don't really think you can fairly label this band with one label. Um, the uh, obviously the majority of the band came from metal roots and our drummer original drummer chris nail was a, a punk rocker he, he, he did grow up listening to rush and some other things but he wasn't like a big metal head he was the big punker and we were he was a punker who was starting to put his feet into the water of metal and we were the metalers that were putting our feet into the world the water of punk so it was you know perfect combination we would do tape trading and turn each other on to things that we hadn't really listened to before um so we didn't debut in new orleans on the metal scene we debuted on the punk scene and we really liked it there and we stayed there and eventually the metal scene started coming in with it and uh over the years our shows became kind of like an island of misfit toys you know it was just a place for people to go that didn't have a home uh you could be weird as you wanted to uh, as long as you weren't causing problems for for anybody else uh you could pretty much come and do whatever you wanted and be whoever you wanted to be that and, and i still um uh, like that mindset with our crowd we're not a crowd that's going to isolate or uh, exclude anybody for any particular reason unless you're a person coming in trying to start problems then you gotta go and yeah. we'll make that happen yeah the number one rule of rock and roll don't be an asshole and uh absolutely and you know you brought up a good point and this is something i love having this debate with this is one of my favorite questions to ask because you know i never understood how like the real difference between punk rock and hardcore and metal like i never understood how a person who loved slayer couldn't appreciate a band like Chromags, or like how a band who loved bad brains couldn't appreciate a band like judas priest to me they're both brutally honest aggressive in your face forms of music yeah. so i was wondering in your maybe your perspective i like to get as many perspectives on this as possible do you think that there really is that much of a sonic difference between punk rock or hardcore and metal um I think the, the differences are typically attitude uh, and, you know, sometimes maybe production. Um, but for the most part, you, I, I think the languages are, are a little bit different, but, but the, the content is usually the same. Um, uh, I, I think, I think now more than ever, it's safer to, have a battle vest with a punk rock band and a metal band on it than you know maybe it was 30 40 years ago uh it, I, I don't know that the, the the whole the whole well it's not this so i can't like it thing i, I can't wrap my head around that yeah. i really can and and, and the word hardcore like the european use of the word hard like it just, just like they call life of agony hardcore but like i've never like even when i listen to river runs red i've never considered that hardcore it's like very groovy rock and roll combined with like a metal twist to it and then like you know they've called hate breed hard like and then you know hate breed it's like oh it's not right. hardcore it's metal or it's not metal it's hardcore it's like like the, the term hardcore is like thrown around i i mean i don't want to like you know I don't want to get my ass kicked by a bunch of my friends in the Brooklyn hardcore scene, but like, do you almost feel like it being thrown around so liberally? Like, hardcore doesn't even have like a. It feels like hardcore is more of an adjective than it is a noun. I guess you could say. Right. It, it maybe it's gotten to be uh, cheapened by overuse. It's kind of like uh, "I love you" gets you know thrown around a little bit too much for my taste. You know, "I love you" are it's strong words. You know, when you say it, you, you should mean it and not just have it tagged at the end of a, of a you know a goodbye yeah so uh so yeah like I, now for life of agony and hate breed absolutely hardcore elements to the bands because clearly they've been influenced by hardcore music but i don't know I'm, I'm gonna say i agree with you i don't know that i would say that those bands were pure hardcore bands like to me you say hardcore you i'm thinking you know 
agnostic front, sick of it all, or, you know, uh, uh, even, you know, circle jerks, or black flag, you know, they, but then again, I'm also 51 years old. So that word means something much different to me. Yeah, uh, definitely. But I don't know, hardcore, hardcore is a mindset too. So uh, that's to be taken into consideration as well, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think it's more of a way of life than it is a music genre. I mean, uh, when I was at the infamous Madball show in Tompkins Square Park that made uh, news everywhere, I mean, I saw a diverse group of people. I saw people in, you know, Slayer shirts. I saw people in cro shirts. I saw people in My Chemical Romance shirts. So, like, it really does have, like, a variety. I think it's more of a way of life and an attitude than a genre. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. The same, and same thing with punk. You know, you know, you get some people that are like, "Well, punk is like, you know, uh, Dead Boys and The Damned and uh, and Misfits and stuff like that." You know, but you know, to somebody else, punk might be The Ramones, Sex Pistols. I don't know. It's <laughs> to my generation, it would be Blink One Eighty Two. Some people, and then there's some. Oh, they like Green Day's punk. Yeah, <laughs> or Blink-182. That's my punk rock. That's how badass I was as an 11-year-old kid. <laughs> you know, it, it's all, it, it all comes from somewhere. You know, uh, when Black Sabbath came around, um, heavy metal wasn't really like a thing. They were just a, a dark rock band, you know? So, um, you know, today you could look at Black Sabbath is some of the, you know, one of the creators of, of doom metal. And at the time, nobody was calling it doom metal. The, you know, there were, heavy metal was barely a thing. Or when Judas Priest is referred to as power metal or something like that. Right, yeah. exactly. You know, I, I remember as a teenager in the early 80s, um, heavy metal kind of personified anything that was distorted guitar, long hair, and with some kind of bite or oomph so you might have looked at a band like motley crew and a band like venom and they were just both called heavy metal whereas today you've got subgenres of subgenres and it's it's like so hard to keep track of the the family tree just gets bigger and bigger and more diverse i call it the periodic table of subgenres um <laughs> you're right yep um <laughs> And the final question I wanted to ask you, if of course you're allowed to say, but you know, I'm still jamming more in the Southern Skies two years later. It's a fantastic album and a lot of people still are playing that shit. We've definitely brought it back at Duff's, the famous metal bar to, you know, uh, get yeah. another spin and I've everything. Been there. You know, is there a chance, any chance that we could be getting some new exhorter very soon? Because you're more in the Southern Skies. If it did, it, the number one thing it did was leave us wanting more. We were like exhorters back and we want to hear more of it. That's good to know because we have been working very hard on new material since the pandemic. So um, we're we're we've been demoing songs, uh, doing pre-production, preparing for when we finally do record the actual album. So yes, New Exhorter will be coming at some point. Oh hell yeah! So I can't wait to hear it. So before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time and for such a great conversation. I always love getting lost into like different, you know, bands and genres and stuff. I, uh, it was really fun to be able to talk about that. Uh, is there just anything else w with this upcoming tour you would like uh, to promote? Uh, anything else happening uh, that you're seeing for the year 2022? Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of stuff uh, that I've got going on uh, in addition to Exhorter. Of course, I've got new trouble i'm working on i'm working on a solo album right now uh trying my hand at some other projects uh one business thing that i'm uh going into is uh with an old friend of mine from here uh a lady who's you know made her way in the music industry in the merch side of things uh she approached me with a uh a retail uh online retail uh venture that we're getting into that gives back to the, the artistic community uh we've we've created we've created a giving list at our website where you can come in and decide what musical artist or you know visual artists you might want a portion of the proceeds to go to and you can actually select a beneficiary of your choice a portion of 
your purchase goes to that artist. So it's really cool. That is called Stitch Witch Organic. And we do have Stitch Witch or Organic uh, website. And, and I have that at, uh, I think the link is at my artist pages on Facebook and Instagram. So, uh, so yeah, check that out, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, we're at stitchwitchorganic.com, I think, uh, or at stitchwitchorganic for, for Instagram. Uh, we're we're going to be making announcements really soon for that, but the, basically it, it's it's going to be more than just, you know, music merch. It's going to be all kinds of merchandise, uh, and it, it, we're, we're tending to embrace the, uh, you know, the organic side of things uh, and and really try to, to push small biz that sort of thing uh that means that means i, I a wish lot. i could you know sit here and talk more about it but you know i know we don't have a whole lot of time here but um in, in any event you can message me if you're curious about it and i'll be happy to, to tell you more always awesome well thank you so much everybody we are here with kyle thomas of exhorter catch them on tour this november this is alex from heavy new york and we will see you next time it's been my pleasure, man. Thank you for having me, and we'll see you all in a few weeks. Hell yeah. Bye.